everybody. Welcome once again to our Facebook uh, broadcast. Once again, we're uh, forced to do uh, long distance internet type ministry because of the current situation, which we believe is going to be changing soon. But I'm really, really blessed to be able to come to you and minister to you uh, through the means that that the Lord has provided. Uh, Tonight, it's a very special night. Uh, God's been speaking to me very clearly uh, about the situation that we're in. You know, whenever, whenever things are in a turmoil and storms are blowing, uh, God has a word. And I want to be, begin a message tonight, a series on when kingdoms collide, when kingdoms collide. Because what we're seeing from a prophetic spiritual picture from the heavenlies, we are seeing a collision of two kingdoms, the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God. And the Lord has a lot to say about that. I think it will bless you. I hope you'll stay with us uh, for the message. But like we always do, we want to begin with worship. I need to worship the Lord, especially in these days, continue to praise him. So we're going to turn things over to Becca, Evan, and Seth. And we'll be back with a message in a few minutes. Sins of the world. 
I want to minister to you on the subject of when kingdoms collide. When kingdoms collide. Let me begin with a little quiz. Which country on earth woke up to these breaking news stories over the last three months? Government shuts down Christian church services. Pastors who continue to hold meetings will be arrested. Churches warned that if public meetings are again permitted, gatherings will be limited to 25 people. 
If church services resume, strict social distancing will be required. Are these headlines from Communist China, Russia, a Muslim country, Venezuela? No, friends, these are headlines from the United States of America. And I believe that there will be more to come like this in the days to come. And why do I say that? And let me get right to the heart of what I believe God is saying to his church. The coronavirus crisis is exposing us to a danger deadlier than the disease. It's a coming collision of the kingdoms of man with the kingdom of God. And the question for Christians will be, will we know how to handle it? Now, the Lord's been speaking to me very clearly from a prophetic point of view, and I don't mean predicting the future. When I say the term prophetic, I mean from the place of a seer. The Old Testament prophets were called seers. That means uh, they could see from above. They could see things that the normal eye couldn't see. In other words, everybody sees what's going on, but the, the prophetic can see what's behind what's going on and from a big picture standpoint, so to speak. And so when I speak of when kingdoms collide, I'm talking about situations where the kingdom of man collides with the kingdom of God. I have three points tonight. This is the first message in a series, as I said. First of all, we, we need to establish some things. Christians have certain clearly defined obligations when it comes to civil government. Second, however, our obligation to obey the law and the authority of civil government ends when doing so would clearly contradict the authority of God's law or our Christian conscience. And the third point, and this is the big one, when kingdoms collide, we must obey God rather than man. When kingdoms collide, we must obey God rather than man. Let's look at those. And I really want to, begin with this point because this is critical. We, we almost need to be sure the church has had a crash course in the whole concept of government that, that when, when most people think of government, they hear the term government, they think of the federal government or the state government, some form of civil government. But that's a very limited view of God's concept of government. When it comes to civil government, we have a very clear, biblically defined obligation to the civil government, and we need to start there. God has ordained three spheres of government in the earth under his kingdom, of course. Family government, church government, and civil government. And those actually are listed in the order of importance. Most important, bedrock institution is the family. And the Bible has very clear direction about how the family government is to be aligned. Uh, the father's the head of the house. The, the wife is a, is a partner, a helpmeet. The children are to be in loving subjection to the parents in the church. God has ordained authority uh, through his eldership, through ministry, uh, the fivefold ministry. But when I speak of the kingdom collision that's going to happen and is already happening, I'm talking about the civil government primarily, and we'll focus on that. In Romans 13, the Apostle Paul 
speak specifically on how Christians are to relate to the civil government that he has ordained. He begins with a command to obey. Verse 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Now, remember, he's writing to Christians, but he says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. The NLT version says everyone must submit to governing authorities. Now, in the next verse, he tells us why. Verse 2 of Romans 13. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. What he's saying here is, God has ordained all authority. There's no authority that exists that doesn't find its source in God because he is the ultimate authority. All other authority is really delegated authority. And because of that, in each sphere of government, it's critical that there be submission and obedience. For example, in the family, uh, the children when they dishonor or disobey their parents, here says they are actually dishonoring and disobeying God because God ordained those parents. The same thing works in the church with regards to eldership. And when it comes to the civil government, it's the same thing because he's specifically referring here to civil government and not just good government. You have to remember when Paul is writing here to the church at Rome, the the head of the government of Rome was Nero, who was one of the most evil of all the Roman emperors, and they had some bad ones. But Nero was using Christians for torches in Rome. Uh, He was persecuting the church. He was an extremely evil man. History tells us that. And yet Paul says to these Christians at Rome, be sure you obey the civil authority because it's ordained of God. So it's not just the good government. The, the principle is, is, is generally spoken. Now, now, hold on, stay with me. I've got to bring this first because that's the general principle when it comes to how you and I as believers or to relate to the civil government. Jesus modeled this very thing uh, for us in John 19 when he was dragged before Pontius Pilate on trumped up charges and he was being falsely accused. And at one point he's asking Jesus questions and Jesus is not giving him answers. And uh, he says to Jesus, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power or the authority to crucify you? And I have the power or authority to release you? And in verse 11, Jesus said, you could have no power over me at all unless it had been given you from above. That's powerful. A pilot is saying, I have the power to crucify you. Jesus said, you wouldn't have any power at all if it hadn't been given to you from above. And he's speaking to a very uh, pagan person. The NLT says, uh, Pilot says, you don't speak to me. Don't you know I have the authority to release you? Authority to crucify you? Jesus said, you'd have no authority over me unless it was given you from above. So here's the point. If Paul told the Christians at Rome to obey the government of Nero and Jesus submitted himself to the authority of an evil governor in Jerusalem, then the same principle applies to us today. Paul goes on to explain that God appoints the government for our good. Verses four and five. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good. Of course, if you're doing wrong, you should be afraid for they have the power to punish you. They're God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. 
So you must submit to them not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. He goes on in verses 6 and 7 to say obedience and submission to this federal government or the civil government means paying our taxes. He says, and, uh, pay your taxes for the same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. They're serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them. And give respect and honor to those who are in authority. And once again, Jesus modeled this in his own ministry life regarding paying taxes. In Matthew 17, Mark chapter 12, Luke 20, we see that he was very concerned that the that he and his disciples paid the taxes that were due. That's not the only thing, though, that we're... I love what one leader said. He said, we have three obligations to civil government. We have to pray, to pay, and to obey. Uh, I love that. We are supposed to pray for those that are in authority. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, 1, and, 1 to 3. Therefore, I exhort... You, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for those in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So we're to pray, pay, and obey. Now, I have to say that because it's in the Bible. And we need to understand that is the general principle. That's the first point. The second point is, however, however, there is a place where the obligation to obey ends. There is a place for what we would call civil disobedience. And... We're going to look at that in the light of when that circumstance is, is when obeying the law of man would require us to contradict the law of God. It would come when it would violate the Christian conscience. And we're going to look at that in this next season of time because that is the collision of kingdoms that's coming. It's already here and it's going to get worse. And I'm not a prophet of doom because I'm a very optimistic person and I'm optimistic now. But I don't think we should kid ourselves, beloved. There is something going on beyond what just looks like on the surface here. And it's so subtle that it has to be a satanic strategy. It, it all started with the news of the virus and the government was telling us very simple things. They were really more suggestions than anything else. You know, wash your hands 20 times a day. <laughs> Avoid direct physical contact with other people. Stay at home if possible. So far, so good. I mean, hey, we all want to uh, protect ourselves and others from catching this thing. And these were fairly reasonable things in the beginning. But then, then something began to happen. The federal and the local governments did what governments always tend to do the suggestions gradually became demands. And we're faced with government overreach. What is it when I use the term government overreach? You see, I just outlined to you and took some time to show you that the reach of government authority and our obligation to obey there is a sphere, there's a place that's, that, that we're within the reach of that. But when government overreaches and we are getting used to the overreaching, businesses 
that are considered non-essential were ordered to shut down. Now, again, I don't expect you necessarily to be on the same page as me. Not that I'm more spiritual than anybody else, but I just have alarm bells in me that go off when these things begin to happen. For example, what I just said, everybody knows that, that the government shut down, quote, non-essential businesses. Well, who decides what's non-essential? Who has the right? Who has the authority to decide that your business is non-essential? And so they came up with a list of categories. I want to know who did that. Where do they have the authority to do that? Where in the Constitution, where in the laws of the land did they have this? But they just did it. Travel restrictions imposed by law. Worst of all for Christians, churches were forbidden to meet, to hold public gatherings. I mean, it ought to be a sign of trouble to the church when the liquor stores are open and the churches are closed. Somebody decided that liquor stores are essential, but church services are not. And that ought to get you a little bit riled up, beloved. If it doesn't, I'm just wondering if there's more lamb than lion in you, more lamb than there should be. Government Overreach and shutting down churches was not only a violation of the constitutional right we have for free assembly. It was a clear collision of two kingdoms because Christians have been commanded by God to assemble. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And let us consider one another to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another to assemble, and so much more as you see the day approaching. What he's saying here, he says, when times get tough and things are getting rough more than any other time, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Now, there's a clear command from God to assemble. And the clear command from the kingdoms of man, you can't assemble. That is the collision of two kingdoms. Now, I will say many milk toast Christians never took this verse seriously anyway. People in America especially are so busy with all their toys, they consider church attendance an option. And I'm not fussing, I'm just saying that's a fact. Uh, for many Christians, it's, well, I'll go if it's convenient. And hey, I go two or three Sundays a month, and, but I'm going to do something. That's, that's, they're free to do that. But for those who take God seriously, the conflict of kingdoms in this is clear. Now, we say, well, you're all riled up, aren't you closed? Yes, we are. Actually, uh, most churches, including our own, temporarily have canceled services. Now, some churches ignored the shutdown and continued to meet. And uh, some of those pastors actually were arrested and went to jail. And what shocked me was not that the media made fun of those pastors and ridiculed them for being unfeeling and uncaring because they were having services when they had been told to shut down. They didn't care their people might get sick. And uh, the media was just, just scorning them. But Christians were scorning these pastors. You know, I kept my mouth shut. Frankly, it was convicting to me. I said, you know what? I'm not doing what they're doing, but I understood why they're doing it. The, these, were, these were men who said, you know, I understand, but we're going to do what the word says. And he went to jail for it. That's what they were really doing. I guess it's like I'm wondering what's it going to take to bother us? 
Does it bother you that the government has shut down churches? It's a clear violation of our constitutional right to assemble. Does it bother you that allowing the government uh, to tell us to do something, God told uh, not to do something God told us to do? Does it bother you this degree of accepting government control that extends to the churches? may open the door to even more regulation of the church by the state in the future. In other words, if they, you know, it's the old saying, you give them a wrench, they think they're a ruler. Government tends to overreach, and if you let them overreach, they overreach more. Does it bother you that we've allowed more government control of our lives over the past three months than has been allowed by Americans in over 225 years of history? Do you realize that there's no generation of Americans that's ever lived that has allowed voluntarily the government to have this amount of control over their lives than us. So what have I said? I'm just trying to, I want you to track with me. Number one, Christians do have biblical, clear clearly defined obligations to the civil government, including obedience to the laws. But this says, second point, however our obligation ends when it contradicts the clear commandments of God or our Christian conscience. And here's the big point, and we'll spend most of our time here. When the kingdoms of men collide with the kingdom of God, we must obey God rather than men. And here's the question that's going to boil to the surface. Actually, it's already boiling, and you're going to see more and more of this. And that is the issue of civil disobedience. At what point is it biblical to disobey the civil government? I'm glad you asked. You didn't ask. I'll just give you the question and then I'll give you the answer. Okay, because I know where I'm going tonight. We honor the government and obey the law until obeying the law of man requires us to break the law of God. And when this becomes the case, I want to give you a biblical picture of how to handle it. In Acts chapter 5, the disciples were hauled before the city council and the Sanhedrin, the high priesthood in the church or the synagogue. And the high priest asked them saying, this is Acts 5, 27, 29. Did we not strictly command you not to teach in the name of Jesus? But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, and here's your memory verse for the next year. We ought to obey God rather than men. Didn't we command you that you could not teach or speak in the name of Jesus? And what is the response? Civil disobedience. Respectfully, not in an arrogant way. A simple statement of fact. Because what was being commanded to obey would be a clear violation of what Jesus told them to do. And Peter had it right. We ought to obey God rather than men. The same principle, I'm going to give you examples. Because we need to have Bible for this. This can't be just Pastor Ray's opinion we need to look at the Bible because we are not the first generation to face this. This, is, this has been going on. In Acts chapter 4, so they called in the disciples and commanded them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to listen to God, you judge. But we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Now, there again, this is not a defiant, uh, draw your sword and let's fight 
kind of spirit. This is just a clear statement to the civil authority. You're overstepping. You can command it. You can make a law about it. But whether we ought to listen to you or listen to God, you judge, but we cannot help but speak the things that we have seen and heard. I went back in the Bible and found some other powerful examples. Okay, so bear with me. And these are scriptures you need to know, friends, because your friend, your some of your neighbors are going to be asking you about why you take the position you take in the days to come. And you need to know the Bible on this. Back in the book of Exodus, the Old Testament, Pharaoh commanded the midwives of the Hebrews to kill all the male babies born into the family of Israel. It was a command. Actually, this is the first recorded case of post-birth abortion. Basically, the command of the civil government was when the baby's born, they didn't have sonograms. They didn't know what it was till they came out. When the baby's born, if it's a boy, kill it. That's the law. Verse 17, Exodus 1. But the midwives, that's the women who have specifically assigned to assist the mother in the birth. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded but saved the male children alive. What's going on here? There was a clear collision of two kingdoms. The kingdom of Pharaoh, kill all the boys. Kingdom of God, thou shalt not kill. And the, the, these midwives saved them. What happened to them? They got called to the bar. It says in Exodus 1, 18 and 19 that the king of Egypt called them and said, why have you done this thing and saved the children? And they gave an excuse like, well, they had the baby so fast, you know. They, they had the babies before we can get there. But I think about if the midwives had obeyed the law, just think about it. Moses never would have been born. Or he never would have lived. Think about it. One of the greatest heroes of the Bible would have been killed in a post-birth abortion situation if it weren't for these women. And we don't know, their, we don't know the names of two of them. And look what happens in Exodus 120. Therefore, wherefore, because they had done this, it says God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very mightily. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. Civil disobedience, when kingdoms collide, we ought to obey God rather than man and says God bless them for it. So the same God that says obey the authorities also has limits. There's also a place for disobedience. Same thing in the book of Daniel. I'll give you two examples. Daniel chapter 3. I'm not going to read all of these scriptures. Most of you know the stories. Nebuchadnezzar built a giant golden image, and he said, everyone has to come when they hear the music and bow down and worship this image. That was the law. And he said, uh, if you don't, the penalty the fine will be you're cast into a fiery furnace, which means death. Daniel chapter 3, it goes on to tell about the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They answered and said to the king, O king, we don't need to answer you in this matter. If that's the case, the fiery furnace, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he'll deliver us out of your hand. But even if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image 
that you have set up. That's a beautiful picture, beloved, of what we're trying to talk about when kingdoms collide. And you know what happened. God miraculously delivered them from the fiery furnace. Later in the book of Daniel, in chapter 6, another king commanded that no prayer could be made to anyone but himself for 30 days. But Daniel's enemies saw him praying to his God, the God of Israel, and they turned him in. They ratted him out. And in Daniel 6.13, it says, They answered and said to the king, This that Daniel, one of the captives of Judah, does not show regard for you, O king, or for the decree, the law that you've signed. But he makes his petition three times a day. What happened? When kingdoms collided, Daniel said, I'd rather obey God than men. And he was thrown into the den of lions. What happened to him? Well, in the morning, the king, who liked Daniel, went to the den and in verse 22 said, Daniel said to the king when he approached the den, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, king, I have done no wrong before you. Now, I could give you more examples, but the midwives, the three Hebrew children, Daniel, every one of them, along with Peter and the disciples of the New Testament, I gave you five or six examples of situations where God's people found themselves in the middle of a kingdom collision. Every one of them had the same principles involved. There was a command or a law that contradicted the law of God, and they obeyed God rather than man. These are models for us. And I tell you, you need to know these biblical models. Because when push comes to shove, and it may come shoving pretty quick, there may be a time when you will have to know what to do. How are you going to handle some of these things that are coming down from the federal and local government? Let me try to wrap this up for tonight. I can't preach the whole series tonight, but I'm telling you I'm on fire. We are living in changing times. I'm older than most of you watching. I'm older than most anybody anymore. But the truth is, I've never seen anything like this. Lizzie and I sit around and look at each other and say, have you ever think, seen anything like this? And we've seen a lot. We've been through a lot. Man, we've been through some terrible, terrible times in our country. Nothing like this. I was thinking back when I first went into the ministry I was 43 years old. I'd been in the business world. I didn't really know beans or pumpkins about being a pastor. And Lizzie didn't want to be a pastor's wife. I had to drag her kicking and screaming into the church. And she just wanted to be private. She said, we're private people. We you know, become a pastor's wife. There's people be over here all the time, ringing my doorbell. And blah, 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 blah. Bing, bing, bing. Well, but she finally succumbed to my charm. No, I'm, and became a pastor. So we go in the ministry and here we are, you know, and I don't know anything about it except preach what God tells me. So I'm preaching on some things about the current situation, whatever it was back in 83, 84, whatever. And uh, some people came and said, Pastor Ray, you need to be careful because what you're preaching is a violation of the Johnson Amendment. I said, the Johnson Amendment? What's that? And I had to go look it up. It, it's a part of the tax code named after Lyndon B. Johnson, who was the president who succeeded John Kennedy after he was assassinated. Apparently, LBJ got mad at a a group of pastors who were criticizing his leadership in the Congress. 
And so he just passed an amendment to the tax code that said, basically, if churches endorse a political candidate or attack a political candidate or get too political, we'll take away their tax-exempt uh, freedom. And so I hadn't heard of that. And they said, well, all of them, the churches, that's why I know the churches do it. And I always wondered why when I'd go to church, and I was faithful, go to church for years before I got the ministry, and I've hardly ever heard a pastor take a stand on anything that was politically controversial. And here I am, I'm preaching on this and that. And, you know, they said, well, you could be in a lot of trouble. And what did you do, Pastor Ray? I do anything except keep doing what I was doing. Hey, if God gives you a message about some issue, now I don't believe we should use the pulpit to endorse individuals or take, you know, endorse some political party. I don't believe that's the role of the prophetic or the pastoral. But I do believe that it, if you don't address the issues at hand, when they come up, you are not being faithful to God's word because God will speak to his people. Uh, situations arise. He will speak. And if you're going to be faithful to him, you have to just do what he says. Preach what he says. Well, we did. And hey, I never got arrested. Now, here's another thing. Somebody said, well, but that's been, has that been repealed? No, beloved. I mean, our current president said it was going to be repealed. It's still there. It's still there. And the things I've read say it probably won't ever go away because nobody takes it seriously anymore. It should be repealed. It should be gotten off the books. But I made a choice early in the year, first year of my ministry, that I'm just going to preach what God tells me to preach. And never to fear man because I, if God tells me to do it. Now, I honor authority, beloved. I pray for the leaders. I pay my taxes. I obey the law until I can't. The Johnson Amendment was a no-brainer for me. But now we've got the coronavirus and new amendments are coming out or regulations, requirements, reg uh, whatever you want to call it. It's basically the authority of overreach in civil government and it's complicating things. And the lines are getting blurry. And here's what we all need to pray for, discernment. To stay in a right spirit in our attitude toward all authority, because all authority is appointed by God. And to obey authority and honor authority until we can't, until it conflicts and collides with God. I'm sitting there, Three days ago, just watching the news on Fox News, and here was the headline across the TV. I took a picture of it with my phone. It says, two Massachusetts cities threaten $1,000 fine for citizens not wearing a mask in public. Now, these aren't passed. It's just these cities, governments are saying they're threatening to pass a law that if they catch you outside without a mask, they can fine you $1,000. I'm sitting there asking myself, where do they get that kind of authority? That should bug you, beloved. That should bother you the deepest, deepest. Now, if you're out there, one of the Freddy cats is saying, well, I think that's a good idea. Everybody ought to have a mask. We go, you know what? If you want to wear a mask, wear one. But don't tell me to wear one if I don't want to. Hello, hello, beloved, you don't have the right, with all due respect, you don't have the right to do that. Then I'm reading the Tennessean. This is today. This is today's paper. And I just look at the front page, headline, <clears throat> restaurant stores in Nashville open Monday. Subheadline. Nashville residents still required to stay home as much as possible. 
And then I get to reading. Residents will be will still be required to stay home as much as possible and are asked to wear masks while in public and gatherings of 10 or more people will continue to be banned. And I'm sitting there thinking, where do you get the authority to tell me I can't be in a group of people if there's more than 10? Where's that in the Constitution? Where's that in the bylaws? Where's that in anything? This is what we call government overreach. And friends, what has happened, and when I start talking about this, some of you guys are going to blow a fuse because I'm going to rip the cover off the satanic strategy that is behind all this. And I will tell you right now, it's going to be an eye-opener. I'll give you a taste, okay? How about a morsel? How about an uh, a appetizer, all right? The man who is the father of the modern-day popular socialist political leaders, the man who trained a whole new wave, Saul Alinsky wrote the book Rules for Radicals. He got a famous statement. It's been quoted by many others. He said, never let a crisis go to waste. You see, we're dealing with people who have a strategy to control you, and they use crisis to do it. They will take a crisis and never let a crisis go to waste. They didn't cause the coronavirus, but they're going to take advantage of it. How will they do that? Beloved, these are satanically inspired people who want big government and more control of your life. And they will use any means to get it. So taking the coronavirus, and I got to hand it to them. They're pretty smart. Let me tell you, these are not stupid people. Oh, here's the coronavirus. Let's scare the hell out of people. And then they'll be willing to comply with all this stuff that we can do to make them rely upon us to tell them what's safe or not safe, what they can do, what they cannot do. And if they complain, we'll just tell them, you don't care about your neighbors. You don't care that you could be killing people with your sneezing or your breath or your very touch can kill, and you refuse? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting tickled at myself. This is a satanic plot, beloved. These are not good people who care about you. They're power-grabbing politicos who are trained to do this. This is what they are after. This is why they hate this current president, because he's the other way. On most things, he's the one who wants less government control and regulation of your life. How do you think we got in this mess of the last 25 years, basically choking the potential of the American economy by government regulation, government overreach, and every kind of thing? And here comes someone who says, we're going to get rid of all that stuff and let the economy go, baby. That drives them crazy. And they hate him for it. And if they hear this message, they're going to hate me. But you know what? That's okay. I've been hated by better people than you. And I'm still going. Never let a crisis go to waste. Oh, next week. Uh, I'm going to get into more of that. Many Christians, but bother me. So many are just flowing along. It's like lambs to the slaughter. Mm, yeah. Oh, yeah. Stay at home. Whoa. Stay at home. You know what? Everybody's standing at home. Look what it's done. We're about to wreck the rich nation on earth. In three months' time, just think, we went into 2020 with the greatest economy the world has ever known. Lowest unemployment, highest average salary, uh, every class, every generic group, every ethnic group, all prospering. Everything was fine. Stock market setting records every three or four days. Ripping and roaring in three months' time, something you can't even see has been used 
to destroy this economy if it keeps up. And people say, well, at least I'm well. Yeah, but you're bankrupt. You got no money, got no job, got no hope to have one if you continue this way. As sooner or later, even the caveman who didn't want to go outside because it was cold got hungry and went out and killed a bear or whatever. I just saw this. This was a recent quote from Mario Murillo. I'm closing. Just hold on. Hold on. Mario Murillo said, they're coming after your freedom. They will force feed your children the Antichrist agenda. That is unless we wake up to our purpose and destiny. That's powerful. They are coming for your freedom. He also said, my cry, I couldn't agree more with this. My cry is that when the church doors reopen, the spirit-filled churches will leave Sesame Street and get back to Azusa Street. That's pretty good. That's powerful. Let me tell you something, beloved. The days of this Sesame Street Christianity are going to come to a screeching halt. If there's any silver lining in the coronavirus, it's to bring the church to a wake-up call and say, wait a minute. What are we allowing here? What, what, what is going on? Where is the prophetic voices to point a finger in the face of overreaching political power and say, you, sir, do not have the right to do what you're doing? What would happen if the church woke up like that? If pulpits were filled as they were in the early days of our nation? where ministers saw themselves as prophetic voices holding the government accountable to the word of God and the law of God. I've got a book this thick with sermons from the 1770s and 80s. Beloved, they never heard of the Johnson Amendment. I got to close. I'll give you one thought. Ahab was one of the Israel's wickedest kings. He surrounded himself with false prophets, religious leaders who only spoke good of him. So, we, But he sent from Micaiah, a, a true prophet of God. But the king's men warned the prophet as he was going in to prophesy to the king. And the messenger who had gone to Micaiah spoke to him and said, now listen, the words of the prophets with one accord are all encouraging the king. Please, let your word be like the word of one of them and only speak encouragement to the king. And Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. May our word, when kingdoms collide, be that word. We'd rather obey God than man. Heavenly Father, we don't know what to do but to come to you in an hour like this with danger so real and so prevalent and imminent and yet so many are asleep. But God, you have a way of waking up your people. Our trust is in you for a mighty revival. Even now, I believe that many are being forced to seek you in a serious way, people who've been backslidden, people who've been spiritually cold and dry are coming back because you have the answers. And we pray we can be a part of bringing them back. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. You may feel worse, but I feel better. Hallelujah. Beloved, we think of you, pray for you. We miss you. I sit in my 
prayer place every day. I see faces. I think of people that I miss. And we do. We are persuaded things are going to improve soon. But the truth is, this is the best we can do for now. Weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And that's always the case with God's people. But I want to thank you for your love, your prayers, your financial support. It's just been amazing, your generosity and how you've been faithful. I'm talking to our church family now. You've been faithful to continue to tithe and offer and give. And we've received offerings from people we haven't seen in years and and from people sometimes we don't even know. And uh, we want to bless you for doing that. The list there is how you can give. You can give online at ccnashville.com. You can give through the smartphone app, which is an easy way to give. Uh, The address, the mailing address is there if you want to send in an offering by mail. If you're out of work, can't do it at this time, we're praying for you. We're praying for everyone who's lost a job, laid off, having some kind of a financial shortfall. And we want you to know that. And we're going to keep doing what we're doing, no matter what, because God's called us to do this very thing. And we hope that you'll be helped by everything we're sharing Uh, by the worship, by the messages. We hope you'll share it on Facebook with your friends because I believe these messages are a needed word, a timely word for the body of Christ and the world. When kingdoms collide, we'll have more of that next time. God bless you. In Jesus' name, we love you.